This is the voice of Palestine, the voice of the Palestinian people. Welcome to another edition of The Voice of Palestine. It's December 18th, 2012, and I'm your co-host, Marian Kawas. Our interview tonight is with Jewish-American singer-songwriter David Rovix about his beautiful songs for Palestine, as well as his views on the Palestinian struggle, the anti-war movement, and Zionism. But just before we talk with David, we'll begin with one of his most moving songs, I Want to Go Home, which captures the simplicity and profoundness of the Palestinian people's tragedy. I was born a refugee. It's where I belong, there is no doubt. It's my whole family from that farm. We never did. Nobody harmed. If you're confused by what you heard, let me boil it down to a single word. I want to go home. That on the street, most every day, neighbors kids would kick a ball with my dad when he was small. We were Christians, they were Jews, but it was no big deal. Religious view, so it was strange when at the point of a gun. I want to go home to the Voice of Palestine. Uh, could you, Thank you. Yeah, could you tell us to start with, you know, how did you get involved in the support uh, work for Palestine and the other causes? Because uh, as our listeners are aware, you support uh, most liberation struggles all over the world. Uh, could you give us an idea what motivated you really to uh, take this route? I guess um, 
it's always a little hard to answer because it depends on how far back you go. But uh, the uh, certainly when the second Intifada started in 2000, um, it was, uh, well, I basically I wrote a song about it and then um, about the massacre of the children at the mosque, uh, the Al-Aqsa, outside the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And, uh, and, and then basically I started hearing from Palestinians a lot after that. And so then it was like a snowball effect, you know. Then I just um, had a much more personal connection to uh, what was happening there. And so then uh, more songs uh, started happening and more concerts related to Palestine and, and then a visit to Palestine. So it just uh, one thing led to another. But uh, okay. specifically, that's that's how it... What, 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 that's what? How what is the name of the song? Uh, I don't know if I ever heard it. The first song. Oh, the first one I wrote that it was any good that I kind of put on a CD was Children of Jerusalem. Oh, yeah. On my that's... CD, Living in These Times. Yeah, that's a beautiful song, actually. And you had a really hard time with the Zionists over it, uh, didn't you? Because you... We had a whole tour of Israel canceled uh, as a result, but uh, that maybe was bound to happen. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and I've, I've been picketed by uh, Zionists at a number of different gigs in, in a couple different countries, several different countries. But um, it's, uh, it, you know, I wouldn't call it a lot of trouble, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they they really more threatened with the uh, Jews that oppose Zionism than uh, uh, with Palestinians who are really uh, uh, active uh, against Zionism. We 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 see it yeah. here. We see it here in many instances. It just drives them mad when they see Jews, uh, you know, or people from Jewish background really speak out against Zionism. Uh, yeah. We, we'll talk about that maybe later on uh, in the show, but uh, you know, uh, there you have so many uh, beautiful songs, you know, on Palestine, from the they are building a wall to uh, uh, Rachel Corey to Palestine to the return, you know. You know. Uh, could you tell us a bit uh, how is the, uh, you know, or what, uh, how did they came about? You know, you told us about the children of Jerusalem. And, uh, mm. uh, you know, but uh, could you tell us, uh, you know, how the other ones and Jeanine, I, I guess uh, Jeanine was a response to the massacre in Jeanine, wasn't it? Yeah, they're always in pretty much about current events and <clears throat> in response to things that have been happening in Palestine. But there's always some kind of a, a purpose uh, to them. And I guess... I guess pretty much in most of those songs, um, like the song about about the about Janine uh, and Rachel Corey, and the song the songbird sings about the boy killed for for catching songbirds on the border with Gaza mm-hmm. and uh, Israel. <clears throat> they, they, I guess, uh, other than just writing about current events in in Palestine, these songs um, they're all they're all sort of meant to give a human face to what's happening there by telling a specific story about a specific person. Mm -hmm. And I I always find that when you do that, when you tell a story about an individual or a small group of people, then it's something people can imagine. Mm -hmm. If it's a little boy or a family or a village, people can picture it. And then it's it's not just numbers and statistics and you know ter- terrorists and whatever it, it's people it's just regular people, and then I think that's what that's what's needed in especially in the U.S. and and the, in the West and just in the outside world generally they need and everybody needs to understand the Palestine or other things, you know, in a in a more visceral way, you know. And they're not going to get that understanding unless they go there, really. But hopefully with a song they can, yeah. you know, get some, some of it. Yeah, actually, we we played uh, earlier, as I told you, the uh, I Wanna Go Home. And it's really very simple, you know, because, you know, the Zionists and some of these uh, Christian Zionists who want to say, oh, it's all complicated, you know, and uh, people can't understand uh, the conflict and it's multifaceted, all that nonsense, you know. But this song you you, uh, wrote, really, and... uh, 
recorded is very simple, basically telling uh, the, the world what, why the Palestinians are uh, struggling, you know, and uh, how it was before the Zionist project came to Palestine, and why they are yeah. struggling now, basically, because they are, without, are denied their basic human rights. Uh, so the simple yeah. is to have a home. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just simply very simple. It's, you know, it's about people being kicked out of their homes and yeah. and wanting to return to their homes. And mm. uh, it's, uh, yeah. it, you know, the whole and then the whole question of like, you know, what does it mean to be Palestinian and how is Palestinian nation uh, how it defined? And you know, it's it's kind of like so many questions. How do we define anything? Like, what does it mean to be Jewish or what does it mean to be English or or French or what? I mean, it's and basically in the end it doesn't matter it's nonsense it's a distraction the real point is that you can take specific villages and specific cities Mm -hmm. and say look this city this village was ethnically cleansed of its indigenous inhabitants and they were driven into refugee camps it doesn't matter Mm -hmm. whether they're palestinian or jewish or or jordanian or german or whatever they're people who lived in a town and the town was destroyed and the people were kicked out and they want to go back to that town yeah. you know and anything else is just basically just kind of a, yeah. like a smoke screen or or just you know clouds the whole thing yeah, it's really very yeah. simple yeah, that's true. And also it, it makes people think, really, uh, that if they were in the Palestinian people's shoe, what they would do. I mean, they can't do anything yeah. differently, really, because, I mean, if they are denied their right to go back to their uh, ancestral lands or uh, homeland, yeah. they're gonna, they, the same reaction will be. So that, I thought it was really very powerful. And uh, to tell you the truth, it brought uh, tears in my eyes on, on many occasions. Uh, okay. I listen to it because, you know, it strikes uh, to, to the core of the issue, really, which is every Palestinian is struggling for. Um, you, you know, yeah. you, you wrote also a recent one, uh, uh, 101 uh, Geography uh, 101, for, uh, in uh-huh. response to Netanyahu uh, appearing at the Congress, uh, joint session of yeah. the Congress, and he got 11... Uh, standing ovation. So could you tell us what motivated you really to write that, uh, you know, in addition uh, to, you know, yeah. the hypocrisy of this Congress that stands for a war criminal, while they don't, even to their president, they don't stand the 11 time. Uh, maybe because oh, exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, they, I mean, they're just, the, the American politics is such a, it's a bizarre, you know, little sort of, uh, you know, vaudeville show, and the two parties are constantly just tripping over each other to praise Israel more, and and, uh, it's just, uh, it's really uh, some kind of a tragic comedy. But when he came, when Netanyahu came to speak at the Congress, I think it was 29 standing ovations, I, uh, maybe 11. I guess it depends on how you measure yeah. what, yeah, I, what they sure. measure, <laughs> I, I how many sure. people have to stand. <laughs> but it was just this outrageous sort of, you know, scene where this war criminal is being adored by the Congress. And, uh, you, you know, there's so there are so such simple ways that you can condemn Israeli policies and Israeli leaders and just the whole Israeli state, in fact, uh, that are just so obvious and so hard for people uh, in, in their position who are defending Israel to to defend. And there's such simple questions that they just can't answer. And I think one of those very simple questions, which is one I think everybody should be asking, is just where... Are your borders? If you want recognition as a as a state, as a legitimate state, um, besides the fact that you're you know an apartheid state, you know just looking past that and looking past the you know, origins of the state as a as a state founded on on the ethnic cleansing of the indigenous population, where are the borders of the current state? You know, I mean, 
any country that wants anything, any from the from other their neighbors or from the United Nations or whatever, has to be able to say, yeah. you know, where their borders are. Yeah. And you know, this is something Israel, something very basic Israel can't do. Yeah, yeah, yeah because the border of 47 was the 40, 47, 48 uh, uh, is different from 67. It's different even from mm -hmm. and it's worth noting mm -hmm. also it's the only country in the world that doesn't have a constitution. For simple reason, they don't want to define the borders because when you have a constitution, you have to define your border. You know, so it's uh, that's why they don't have a constitution, which is uh, really tragic. And I think this is why your song was very powerful. And you know, when they, you want to ask not just the world, but even the, the Palestinian people who were ethnically cleansed to recognize Israel, although they want us not mm. just to recognize Israel with no borders, but they want us mm. to recognize it as a Jewish state, which is, you know, mm. it's like asking the South African people, you have to recognize yeah. apartheid, you know, before before we talk to you, which is absolutely, against, uh, which is against uh, one of the uh, most uh, outrageous things, and you know, even. Mm -hmm. Some of the Christian churches, uh, are, even the progressive ones, uh, are saying, oh, yeah, let's, let, let, let us recognize them as a Jewish state without realizing mm. what about the 20, 25 percent of Israelis who don't belong to the Jewish faith. Yeah, and yet if, if South Af apartheid South Africa were trying to tell uh, everybody in the world they have to recognize us as a white state mm -hmm. as an apartheid state then most of the world would just say well that's crazy yeah. but because it's jews be wanting to be recognized as a jewish state they can have a, a country that is at least as obviously an apartheid state as as south africa was and uh, you know, even according to many people who fought against apartheid in South Africa, who like Desmond Tutu, who went to Palestine and said you <laughs> quite clearly this is worse than South African apartheid. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, and yet they'll get all this sympathy from people in the United States and Germany and Canada and Australia and other countries. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially in the U.S. Of course, as the yeah. main obstructionist in the United Nations. You know, it's yeah. just it's outrageous, and it's of course a you know. A, of course, for the Palestinians, it's a very unfortunate sort of accident of history that that they got to get occupied by specifically by people who had just uh, you know had this, these terrible crimes committed against them. Yeah. But uh, it's um, which had nothing to do with Palestinians. Yeah. But you know this is uh, this is how it is. It's a twisted reality. You know you yeah. couldn't make this stuff up if you were trying to write some fiction about some strange planet. You know I mean it would just be too yeah. too bizarre. But it's yeah. reality. But it's amazing how, how people believe these simple things, you know, uh, if they br you brainwash them enough, they could they don't think for themselves because, I mean, uh, they go, don't go beyond, you know, yeah, it's nice to recognize the Jewish state without realizing the history of Zionism or the history of, uh, of the region even, you know, because yeah. Zionism really was, uh, was a settler colonialist movement from the start. They never really uh, mm. said that they they, they want to go back home the, to reclaim, you know, the biblical nonsense, because most of the Zionists at the early stages were secular. They, they didn't. And in the first Zionist Congress, as will, uh, you know, that uh, they, they, they said uh, very clearly, our objective is to colonize, <laughs> you know, the land in Palestine. They didn't say to go back to the land. So, you know, I mean, uh, that, that was, that, that's history. I mean, people could Google the first Zionist Congress and see what yeah. was their objective. It wasn't really to go back, you know, like they uh, talking now from religious perspective, and, uh, you know, yeah. because they were uh, in diaspora for 2,000 or whatever uh, years outside, and they want to go back, you know, which is, again, another <laughs> another subject. But, uh, you know, the, such simple facts, in addition that the Palestinians has a history, a long history, and, uh, you know, a large number of us are from the Hebrew tribe, you know, like especially the Christians, mm -hmm. 
the Christians who believed in Christ were mainly from the Hebrew tribe. So, you know, to deny uh, these uh, uh, people who stayed in the land for 2,000 and more years, yeah. and to say, you know, a, a Jewish Ashkenazi from Europe has the right to yeah. that land, but not a Hebrew who converted to Islam or to Christianity doesn't have mm-hmm. the right to that land. You know, again, uh, I don't know, it's, it's really amazing, but again, shows you the power of the uh, propaganda machine that Israel yeah and and, and no, it makes no sense whatsoever and especially I mean it makes no sense right now and, it, and then when you look back at the, the earlier Zionist movement documents and, and statements of course it the uh, you know the, the colonialist racist mentality is is much more obvious even than it is today although today it's just it's very yeah. very obvious you know to anybody who's looking at the situation you know who's not just watching Fox News all the time it's, yeah. it's yeah. you know but of course who has the power it's always it's yeah. unfortunately what it comes down to right but yeah. but yeah. The, what's happening is so clear yeah. you know and it's amazing that more people don't uh, just uh, see it for what it is but yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah like you said you know uh, people don't uh, see beyond uh, the uh, propaganda um, uh, aspect of it you know that uh, what happened to yeah. the Jews although you know again I mean the, the Zionists were uh, didn't care really to save Jews in the, during the uh, Second World War. Actually, no. there is a famous quote from uh, yeah. Ben Gurion where he said, in 1938, he said, "If I have a choice to save all the uh, children in Germany, that's the Jewish children in Germany, and take them yeah. to to England, or save half of them and take them to Palestine, I'll choose the second one." <laughs> you know, he it's was willing. Chilling, to isn't it? He was willing to sacrifice yeah. of half of the Jewish children. So for his political objective, uh, nothing more, yeah. nothing less, and they played a role in the quotas, uh, you know, I mean, it's not really uh, only the North American governments that put quotas uh, on saving Jews from uh, the Holocaust, but also the Zionists supported that because they didn't want them to come here, they want to force Jews to go to Palestine, because... Yeah, no, it's amazing, they wanted the Jews only to come to Palestine, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah they didn't care. Yeah. yeah, incredible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it it's is. chilling, and of course, it's one of these things that you know very few people know. Not only, I mean, very few people actually know that as well that uh, that the history of of so many different countries and turning Jews away from who are trying to get out of Germany, but they certainly have no idea that actually the Zionists were part of the reason why mm-hmm. Jews were getting turned away from places like the U.S. and Britain. It's almost uh, yeah. inconceivable for people to just. Imagine Imagine mm-hmm. that, that other Jews were actually mm-hmm. trying to prevent people, uh, Jews from leaving Europe yes. in order to try to force them to colonize Palestine. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's for yeah. political ideology, uh, again, like uh, we, we, yeah. I uh, emphasize, you know, because it is a political ideology, because it's similar to the settler colonialist uh, European, uh, uh, you know, power elite who wanted to, to reach to Africa, like Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, mm. uh, uh, Algeria, South Africa, you know, they, they were trying to imitate the other elite, but in this case uh, was from the Jewish uh, rich, uh, uh, you know, mm-hmm. sector of uh, that. And, you know, when the Belfort Declaration was issued, it was issued to uh, Rothschild, who was one of the millionaires in Britain. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you're aware of that, uh, David, but when the Belfort uh, uh, the declaration was introduced to the uh, cabinet, to the British cabinet uh, in 1917. Uh, November 2nd, 1917, the only one who opposed it was the only Jewish minister, <laughs> you know, and mm. he was prophetic, you know, he said, you know, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, when, if you declare the, this ideology, people is going to try to get rid of their Jewish population, and this is what happened mm-hmm. in Germany. He, he said that 30 years before, or t- uh, actually 20 years before the Holocaust started, and he didn't yeah really only care about the Jewish uh, survivor, but he also said, you know, what are you going to do to the indigenous people in Palestine? So he, he, yeah. it's worth noting that because, you know, I think also the Jews uh, in the early stages were the first one to oppose Zionism. Don't you think so? 
Yeah, yeah. Jews, most Jews were opposed to Zionism for a whole lot of different reasons, of yeah. course. And the main reason being self-preservation, the idea that if Jews, because Jews were often seen as having a loyalty other than to that of the, whatever country they lived in. And so people, and just Catholics, you know, same kind of problem with the Vatican, you know, so, so this idea of a dual loyalty and, uh, you know, which is the same problem lots of different people face, you know, basically, I guess any, any sort of ethnic or religious mm-hmm. minority of some kind in any country it can, might face that kind of thing. But, you know, Europe has a terrible history of, of racism and xenophobia and uh, and certainly Jews uh, were the victims of that along with so many other people all in, in, throughout European history yeah. but uh, this um, I think you know what but most Jews whether they were left wing or right wing or you know whether they were you know xenophobes themselves or not uh, you know they still saw the sense in not supporting the Zionist movement because they didn't they thought that would just add fuel to the fire for for the idea that they had a dual loyalty and then also of course many Jews had before especially uh, well, I mean, now as well, in, in in many ways, but you know, for what for complex historical reasons, a lot of Jews over the past couple of centuries have have been left wing and internationalist, and have seen the uh, problem of, uh, yeah. of of some kind of colonial movement. But of course, uh, you know, and then it's the Nineteen with World War Two and the Holocaust in Europe that changed uh, things and uh, mm-hmm. a lot more Jews started supporting the Zionist movement and then of course they got support from the biggest most powerful empire the world's ever known the U S mm-hmm. and uh, and now uh, of course uh, yeah that's the main thing that's the main problem is I mean if they didn't have if the Zionists didn't have U S support then they'd have to actually really you know work something out. Yeah, yeah, that's that's another issue. They are empowering them, really. Uh, although you know, uh, they they know the Middle East strategically is very important, and if they lose that region, if there is democracy, <laughs> they're going to lose that region for sure. And that's why they're imposing dictatorships on the people of the Middle East. So you yeah. know, uh, you know, uh, what do you think? Uh, you know, lots of uh, talk about Obama, but he really was a disappointment. Although from the beginning. I didn't really hold much hope for him, uh, especially no. after, after reading, uh, you know, what Nader uh, said about him and uh, um, uh, the other, um, uh, uh, the senator, he's uh, from Arab, uh, Abu Rizik, uh, from Arab origin, he's from, uh, you know, the senator Abu Rizik. He really, you know, even before he was elected, they, they warned that uh, he's no better than any other uh, 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 politician in in the uh, system in the U.S. So yeah. uh, you know uh, he, he went to Cairo. He made that speech, but really it's hypocrisy. Really, they they just trying to play on the uh, on, on the people's uh, emotions rather than uh, really they sincerely yeah. they were saying about freedom and democracy and human rights. Oh yeah, it's easy to give a good speech and and to, to to give it convincingly and to say all the right things. It's easy to have the rhetoric and the vague statements about mm-hmm. democracy and liberty and all this stuff, you know. But of course, what really matters is what a politician does, you know, mm-hmm. and the, you know what what actually you know how they actually govern what what bills they get passed and you know, yeah. I mean what what they do. I mean, and of course, what he's done has been just. Just one terrible thing after another, you know. Yeah, yeah. And what he said has been often, you know, really great tearjerker speeches. I mean, he, that speech in Cairo was really good. You know, I mean, yeah. he's given he's he gives a lot of good speeches. He's he he, he and he's got a good speech writer, and he writes well himself. Yeah. And he can eloquently and articulately say the right things. Mm-hmm. But, but you know, and unfortunately people don't often realize that politicians lie that's what they do and that that's yeah. and the system here is totally corrupt and it's ruled by big corporations and these people are not representing your interests and mm-hmm. 
but they keep on thinking. People keep on thinking. So many people keep on thinking, well, this guy's different, you know. But uh, no, no, it's the two parties. Both of these parties yeah. are totally, it, hopelessly corrupt, you know. Yeah. And it's not, I mean, maybe, I think it is still a little more, it's different in a lot of other countries. I mean, a lot of other countries, I think even Canada has a much better democracy, much more democracy. Three parties is a lot better than two parties. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. but here it's really, really corrupt. Yeah, and if you don't have the money, you can't afford to run anyway. You know, I think it's a big That's business. Right. It's a big business now. And, uh, you know, even uh, uh, your uh, people that you count on, you're basically deceiving them. That's, I mean, the, these politicians are doing that. Uh, they're trying to deceive the people by giving them, you know, because he he's not good on local issues either. I mean, uh, all he did is save the banks and they save the car companies and these multinationals from from yeah. uh, from taxpayers' money. <laughs> I mean, not from his pocket. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then the way that the banks were bailed out, and you know, yeah. both the bailout that Bush helped engineer and the bailout that Obama helped engineer are both. Mm -hmm. you know, really designed to bail out the corporations and not the regular people. I mean, you can see that the foreclosure crisis continues yeah. uh, at, at a terrible pace, mm -hmm. and yet banks uh, get what they need to stay in business, you know. Mm -hmm. How about people getting what they need to stay in their houses? Well, that, that was never part of the arrangement. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to move a bit to the anti-war movement. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, objectively speaking, I mean, people are trying to do as much as they can. The same with the 99% movement. Uh, they're trying to, but within the context of the uh, struggle, you know, between the have and have-nots, you know, it looks like uh, the leadership of the movement is not up to this. Uh, up to snuff, you know? What do you think? Well, I just think that the leadership, I mean, there can't be any real leadership unless there's a movement, you know, and the movement just doesn't really exist in any kind of serious way. We haven't had what I would say, what I think you could characterize as a real anti-war movement in the U.S. since 2005, at least, mm -hmm. uh, if not before then. And it was it was very much happening in 2001, two, and three, and then um, and I think it really it makes perfect sense, you know, in a way, you know. Not from a moral point of view. From a moral point of view, everybody should be actively trying to overthrow American imperialism all the time. Morally, of course, everybody in the world should be doing that. But uh, in reality, that's not how it works. In reality, you know, people anywhere in the world, they only act when they believe that there might be some chance that their actions can make a difference, unless they're just so completely desperate that they're going to act regardless of whether they can make a difference. And, of course, people can get to that point, too. But mostly, people act when they think that, that, that their actions might have some chance of making a difference. And in the U.S., in 2001, 2, and 3, until, until Bush sent the troops into Iraq, up until that point, people thought, a lot of people thought that if millions of people were out in the streets on a regular basis uh, protesting and uh, loudly, then uh, the government might listen. And that was very naive of people to think that. They, they really, it was very naive. Of course, you need to do a lot more than just protest. Uh, mm -hmm. You need to do, like, more what they you know, with the uprisings in the Arab world, in something more like you have to yeah. be in the streets and stay in the streets until your demands are met. You can't just have a protest and then go back next month and have another protest, you know. But but people were optimistic, and then they realized uh, that really the government really wasn't listening and really didn't care, and then a lot of people became uh, hopeless rather than getting more radical and getting into more... Uh, more effective tactics, uh, people just went back home. And, but that's, uh, yeah, so it would be nice if there were leadership that were trying to say, okay, look, that didn't work, so now we have to be more militant. But, uh, you know, it, that's, um, it's not the leader, the people, the leaders follow the people. It's not, yeah. not that the 
follow, the people follow the leaders. So it's not up to any leaders to say we got to be more militant. It's up to people to do that, and then the leadership will evolve out of that. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I agree with you totally, and this is basically why uh, you know the there is no uh, visible leadership either because uh, the struggle didn't reach to the point where you know to challenge the government because you know these uh, multinational corporations are not you know they, they they talk about democracy but they're not going to listen to anybody even if the whole country is against them unless their interests are threatened uh, you know economic interests. Yeah. So that, that's uh, that's the thing there, and uh, I guess uh, the you know because you know uh, after 2008, I mean people are their their uh, economic situation is really getting worse and worse all the time. So it's, uh, the objective conditions are are there already, you know, for people to say enough is enough, and we want a real democracy, and we want our control of our resources, basically. Yeah, yeah, and and really, I think I, I, we may be sitting on a powder keg. I mean, it's really hard to say. I don't think anybody. Uh, certainly, I think the the left. I mean, people like me never know. I mean, we're all. It seems like we're always caught by surprise. I don't know. We, I, certainly, I don't know. Yeah. We may be sitting on a powder keg. It certainly would make sense that we would be. I mean, there are millions of people without a place to live in this country. Yeah. Millions of homes yeah. foreclosed on. Yeah. Millions of people that had a decent job and a decent home until mm -hmm. 2008 and are now living in tents or living in shelters. I mean, that's huge. Uh, you would think, and there's so many more people who are so close to that situation, yeah. that at some point people have got to realize, oh, okay, everybody else is in this situation too. I mean, I, I wrote a song about it, actually, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's well, going to be the title of my next CD, Everything Can Change. It's just laying it out there. Like, yeah. I think that the whole thing, you can see the whole thing in like a three-step process, basically, yeah. uh, with, with any kind of social movement. It's yeah. first, everybody has to have the same problem, or at least a lot of people have to have the same problem. Second, everybody has to realize that they all have the same problem. Yeah. And then the third step is everybody has to realize that if they all work together, yeah. they can change everything. Yeah. Well, and, we... and this, you know, yeah. what's that? Uh, what CDs it's on this uh, song, uh, so people, uh, if they're interested. Oh, it will be on my next CD. It's, it's coming <laughs> up. Oh, so it's a new yeah. one. Okay, good. That's yeah. what it's on. I mean, you can hear a primitive version of the song on YouTube that I recorded with my phone, you know, called Everything Can Change, but, yeah. but it's not a very good version, but yeah. it's, okay. it's there on YouTube. Yeah, okay, that's great. So people should look forward to that, actually. I, I'm looking forward to that. And, uh, you know, we, we could uh, uh, get it uh, from the new CD. When it's going to be out, uh, uh, David? Well, my, I mean, my, my new CD that I'm currently sending the copies out and promoting and everything is out now. And it just oh. came out a couple of weeks ago, and it's called Meanwhile in Afghanistan. But then I'm already working on another one, and I don't know when it'll be out. But it'll probably be out in the next couple of months, yeah. at least online. Yeah, and it's going to be called Everything Can Change. Yeah. Oh, that's the name of the CD, too. Okay. That's yeah. Great. That's great. Uh, okay. Um, you know, um, the... Uh, the um, what really moved me also uh, from your song is the one you wrote about the Mavi Marmara. Uh, mm. it, you know, it, it captures also the whole history of the Palestinians because, uh, you know, uh, 80 to 90 percent of Palestinians living in Gaza to start with are refugees. You know, only the indigenous yeah. people of Gaza is, don't exceed 20 percent of uh, the people in Gaza. So in it, you really talked about the history of this and this is already out uh, on uh, 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 on CD so uh, uh, mm. uh, could you tell us a bit about it and how people can get their CD your CDs in general oh sure that and that one is on the CD that I did last year called Big Red Sessions mm. and they're all at davidrovics.com if people click on buy stuff or, or they can listen to all of it for free there too or download it for free or by donation there too but that's on Big Red Sessions and and I wrote that song um, of course a few days into the uh, after the siege on the Mavi Mamara massacre and um, 
And yeah, that was. Uh, I wanted to try to put the whole thing into context because mm -hmm. I knew that I would be singing the song for a lot of people who had never heard of uh, of, of the uh, flotillas or the blockade against Gaza or even who, people who didn't know about anything about Palestinian history or the history of the state of Israel. And, you know, that's who you're dealing with, you know, so mm -hmm. and when you're singing for, for American audiences. And uh, so I, and I think, I think I did a pretty good job for the first sort of very long first verse of uh, laying out the background from basically 1948 to the present, you know, so people would have some idea of what the next verse was going to be about, which was about the formation of the, uh, of the movement, the, the flotilla movement, and, uh, and what they were trying to do with the Mavi Marmara. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, describing what the Israelis did in, in response, which was you know, essentially, to uh, massacre unarmed uh, people yeah. in a sort of pirate attack. Yeah. Uh, um, you, you know, I, I want to go back to uh, the U.S. role in the world, uh, the, the uh, imperial role. And, uh, you know, uh, basically, uh, without the military-industrial complex, the, the U.S. economically is bankrupt, really, you know, because uh, uh, last year they tripled uh, their uh, uh, export of these arms uh, deals uh, to the world. They sold, I believe, over $60 billion, you know, and, uh, and uh, $33 billion went only uh, to Saudi Arabia and around 5 or 6 to the other Gulf states. So it shows you how much the, the U.S. economy is dependent on their lackeys in the Middle East. And uh, mm. they, they're going to be really vicious in uh, trying to suppress the people in keeping these, what I call them uh, family regimes because, you know, in Saudi Arabia and in uh, Bahrain and Qatar and uh, in Kuwait, you know, even in Morocco, they are family regimes, really. The family controls the state and they control it forever, you know. Uh, so yeah. it is imposed on the people and they are imposing all these dictatorships, basically, uh, to keep uh, this, uh, uh, you know, the, this economy going, whether it's uh, military, uh, before it was uh, the cars and all other uh, the consumer products, now they can compete with China, so uh, the, it is mainly the military. So without these, you know, I, I, the, if there is a cliff, uh, if the Arabs are liberated and they stop dealing with the U.S., the cliff will come uh, very soon, uh, the cliff of the imperial power, the U.S., basically. Not, yeah. we, we don't wish it on the people, <laughs> mind you, but uh, no. uh, what's going to happen is uh, the cliff is going to take the empire down with it. Yeah, and the, what's, the whole situation is, uh, I mean, what's always striking to me is the difference between the rhetoric and the reality. When, you know, as you say, the, the U.S. It has this massive uh, it, military industrial complex, which is half of our tax dollars here. And so, you know, like I, a friend of mine is an economist, and uh, and he he and and also myself have been to Japan a whole lot of times. And if anybody who goes to Japan, you just gotta be impressed by the a lot of things. But one thing is just how incredibly efficient the mass transit is. And you know, then come back here where it's just in such a state of disrepair. And yet, the average Japanese pays less tax than the average U.S. citizen. And they get so much more for it, you know, and uh, because we spend half of our tax dollars on the military. So, mm -hmm. you know, people here are also victims of this, this yeah. whole setup. They're not, they're not profiting from it, you know. These jobs are not, uh, I mean, of course, if you're working for some big military con contractor, you're making lots of money, but... By and large, uh, this is, it doesn't even employ all that many people. You know, we could be employing so many more people doing so many things, <laughs> like, uh, you know. But, and then, of course, they say 
that they're aiding uh, democracies around the world with the, all, all these military sales, uh, and of course, uh, while doing exactly the opposite. Well, and not only do they support dictatorships and and oppose a democracy, a democratic movements, but w- what I think people, if they knew about it, would find even more shocking is these the, the most terrible people that they're always uh, saying are just so awful the, the islamists you know yeah. uh, who who knows the history of the us support for the most uh, yeah. The most misogynistic movements you can find in the world ever. You look for the worst of the of the anti-democratic Islamist groups in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and see what their origins are. And you'll find the CIA over half of them. You know, yeah. it's uh, of course uh, a lot of these movements have developed into much, much better movements than what they started out as. But, you know, you look at the history, of, and not only the CIA and the U.S., but also Israel, yeah. and, and how Israel has tried for so long to divide the secular from the yeah. religious groups, you know. And, and they, uh, yeah, they promoted Hamas, actually, in the early stages. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, that, that's. Uh, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You think also that uh, they they doing it on purpose. I mean, uh, are they stupid or are they doing it on purpose so they create the new bo- boogeyman since the Soviet Union yeah. collapsed? They're trying to uh, yeah. create this new boogeyman to keep the military industrial complex uh, going and producing. Yeah. Basically, do you what do you think? Uh, I wonder. Either way, it works for them. Yeah. You know, and it, and I think that for many of them, they they realize some of them are thinking like, hey, I, I don't know, I don't know if it's all so consistent. Because what I think is happening is that there are people within the ranks of the CIA and stuff mm-hmm. who think, okay, we're doing some bad stuff here, but at least we're we're it's it's for some better greater cause yeah. out there somewhere like we have to we have to be uh, opposed to these democratic movements uh, and and support these islamists because and they'll make up some reason but they don't actually think that what they're doing is trying to create a boogeyman whereas i think other people you know are well aware okay we're creating the next boogeyman and that's good we need that yeah. so we can justify all the security expenditure. I mean, yeah. maybe, you know, I'm sure both of those things are going on, but it's a brilliant arrangement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, you for, know, for keeping on. Yeah, they, they, but they don't have any big boogeyman, though. I think they, you know, they're always chronically lacking in real serious, uh, yeah, you know, bad yeah. guys. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, they trained him, and he was their uh, financial, <laughs> financial. Uh, yeah. Uh, minister uh, when the the war yeah. against the Soviet were going on so and the, the same with the Libyan uh, fundamentalists now with the Syrian fundamentalists uh, but yeah. uh, you know, I I I just uh, like to uh, also touch on your songs, really, because you have some powerful songs. One of my favorite is uh, uh, Operation Iraqi Liberation. Uh, mm-hmm. that spells oil, you know. <laughs> Did they actually call it that at the beginning when they invaded Iraq? Because I'm not. Yes. Really, uh, Apparently, they actually did, and it was released to the media, and the Los Angeles Times yeah. uh, published this, the uh, ty- the name of the war, and yeah. other newspapers held back and waited until they were sure. <laughs> so yeah. I, you know, and then they changed the name of it, and a lot of different, most of the news outlets just went right along with the name change and never really, yeah. uh, I mean, it was you know, a hyper-patriotic period, and, of course, these are big corporations, and, yeah, they actually, uh, it, uh they, they, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, 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 which spells O-I-L. Yeah, O-I-L. Operation yeah, Directed yeah. Liberation. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, it's it's really powerful because it shows also the the um, uh, uh, purpose behind this war really uh, against. Uh, yeah. uh, the same with I mean uh, uh, the, even the war uh, against Libya has this. Uh, uh, yeah. 
this objective uh, because they want to control all these and if they could have done it they would have done it to uh, uh, Chavez uh, in Venezuela you know because they tried not yeah. for lack of trying you you have a beautiful song which again gives the dimension of your internationalist perspective for Chavez and the other um, mm. the other struggle could you tell us a bit about those uh, yeah um well I think that uh, really until, I mean, with the era of uprisings, uh, it's, there's so much we don't know about where things are going to go. It's, it's very much in flux, and it's very very exciting mm-hmm. times, I think, in, in many uh, good ways. And, of course, the U.S. is always uh, on the wrong side and trying to mess it all up and make sure that nobody good uh, comes to power. But uh, in, in Latin America, by contrast, uh, the U.S. has been very actively trying to support dictatorships and opposed democracy for uh, at least 150 years there. Mm. And um, in, since about 1998, finally, the U.S. has been having some really, really major setbacks, starting with the election of Hugo Chavez and, you know, continuing on with elections and social movements throughout Latin America. And now at this point, the majority of Latin American governments for the first time ever are run by uh, bona fide left-wing movements. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there are so many ways that people from uh, outside of Latin America can understand the significance of the social movements that have come to power throughout Latin America. But one way to understand that is, you know, if people think back to 12 years ago and, and the social movement that existed for a brief period in the U.S. and Canada mm-hmm. uh, again, that was focused against these big uh, multilateral trade agreements and the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, you know, the World Bank at that time, at the time that we were in the streets protesting against the World Bank all the time 12 years ago, the World Bank, most of their business was in Latin America. Mm-hmm. Okay, today, today, something like 10% of the world's banks' business is in Latin America. Mm-hmm. So uh, they've been driven out of Latin America, yes. you know, by, by social movements and very significantly by Hugo Chavez because yeah. they have oil in Venezuela yeah. and they formed the Bank of the South. And now everybody who needs to borrow money borrows from the Bank of the South and they ignore the IMF and the World Bank. Mm-hmm. It's, um, you know, it's it's. An, it, it's hard to understate the significance of what's happened in Latin America since 1998. Mm. Uh, and it's, um, you know, for, for I think for a lot of people in the world, uh, it's been the beacon of hope for, you know, those of us who believe in the possibility of, of socialist movements coming to power and, and, uh, and, 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 and really bringing about some kind of real democratic uh, change and, and uh, taxing the rich and, and allowing the poor to eat and have medical care and, you know, these kinds of things that we've been fantasizing about for a long time yeah. are actually happening on a widespread yeah. basis, and, and it's been a real, yeah. and, you know... Uh, and uh, Brazil is one of the uh, uh, superpowers that's emerging, really, in, in Latin America with uh, with the leftist government sure. also. Um, you know, uh, yeah. uh, um, I hate to, t- <laughs> to uh, t- uh, finish the conversation, but I, I have to say that one of your most beautiful songs that uh, I admire, and uh, it really shows that... Uh, Solidarity with the oppressed is, uh, should be the, uh, the uh, trend, in, uh, with, uh, regardless of nationality or, uh, or uh, uh, religion or you know, any other things that divide us. And this is, is the St. Patrick Battalion. And really, I recommend mm. it for uh, all our li- listeners. And they could have, uh, order it, they could go to your website. And I think it's in, on more than one. CD, so they could order yeah. it as part of CD. But it's a really beautiful song, and we often played it for these people who went to Palestine, the internationalists uh, uh, who yeah. went uh, to Palestine and supported the cause. It's a story of the uh, Irish, I guess. Uh, could you tell us a bit about it? You know better than me about the, the history of that. Uh, sure. Mm. Sure. 
And I think, you know, the, well, what happened was uh, basically, in a nutshell, during the uh, U.S. The unprovoked invasion of Mexico in 1846, when most of Mexico was annexed and became part of the U.S., everybody who was arriving from Europe in Ellis Island was being drafted into the army and told to go invade Mexico. And uh, there were thousands of people who deserted from the U.S. Army as they got deeper into Mexico. But there were 202 of them, mostly Irish men, who deserted from the U.S. Army and joined the Mexican Army and formed the Mexican Army's only foreign legion and fought uh, very um, valiantly against uh, the U.S. in five different battles. Most of them were killed in battle, and the rest of them uh, that survived mostly lived out the rest of their lives in Mexico. Um, but the thing that's so iconic about the story and, and so inspiring for so many people mm -hmm. is that it's, uh, I mean, it's the whole concept of being someone who has no particular personal, you know, historical interest in this conflict that you are mm -hmm. joining somehow, and then you, you take the conscious step to join the side that is the right side in the conflict, you know, yes. and, and uh, this... Yeah, and the side of the oppressed, basically, you know, because yes. you know, they, that they are being, you know, uh, trying to uh, oppress them, basically. That's what happened, really. Yeah. Uh, that's what's happening nowadays uh, all over the world, and, uh, the, the, you know, that's what the U.S. is doing all over the world. Uh, and really, as I said, it's really inspiring. So uh, we really recommend this song. And could you uh, just, uh, we're running out of time, uh, David, and uh, we really appreciate you talking with us uh, and keep up the good work and keep these beautiful <laughs> songs coming because they are inspiration to all of us so could you just give us, you could you give us uh, your website again so people will uh, oh yeah yeah, yeah davidrovix.com and you can find me on twitter and facebook as well yeah. Okay, that's great. It was a pleasure talking to you, David, and keep up the good work, as I said, and uh, we'll, uh, for sure, we'll talk to you uh, soon. Have a good night. Great. Thanks so much, and take care. Good night. And with that, we conclude another edition of The Voice of Palestine. I've been your co-host, Hannah Kawas. And we will finish off the show with another of David's beautiful songs. The song is called The Songbird Sings, and we dedicate it to all the children in many countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Palestine, Iraq, and the U.S. itself, who have all been victims of the greed of the U.S. military-industrial complex. Was another Friday morning I was among the olive trees out looking for birds to catch my father, his friends, and me. I had my string and net and a nimble eye there beside the farmer's field where the songbirds fly. When you're catching birds, the world disappears and a thousand songs of autumn are all that fills your ears they sing their songs so brightly at the dawning of the day they fly back and forth over the fence where we must stay away you can see the birds beneath the clouds watch them spread their wings listen to the wind and the song the songbirds sing It's so good to come here, so far from all the sound, of all the shooting and the shouting, and the tanks upon the ground. I just wish I could live here, 
inside this olive grove Just me, my friends and family And a small wood burning stove You can see the birds beneath the clouds Watch them spread their wings Listen to the wind And the song the songbirds sing I caught three sparrows It was quite a day Now I'm bound for glory That's what they say I can hear them talk about me Shedding tears upon a sack Inside there lies a child With four bullets in his back You can see the birds beneath the clouds Watch them spread their wings Listen to the wind And the song the songbirds sing You can see the birds beneath the clouds Watch them spread their wings Listen to the wind And the song the songbirds sing